Um, I have all three of your books. Oh boy. Oh, well, that. I did. yeah, Indeed. yeah, I do. And I have this one too. So <laughs> no, I, I, I go big or go home. So totally. Um, but yeah, so how I do things is I like to just roll into a conversation, keep it as authentic and organic as possible. So anything you say can and will be used against you. No um, good, good. Um, I do have um, a time limitation just in that I need to wrap up by two. So. Okay. So one hour. We got it. Yep. All right. So first thing first, um, I noticed something very interesting come across your Twitter feed or your timeline that you posted about that really made me go, wait, what? And it was a redirect on looking at the Netflix movie Cuties. Mm -hmm. And I had seen that you had tagged another doctor in and wanted to advise people that the rumors that are going around right now about it aren't true and that we're looking at this as an image thing and reacting versus digging into it. So you kind of got a little bit of heat for that and yeah, right? name calling. Oh, yeah, yeah. And... My, my Twitter's blowing up over that. So can we dig into that and, and see, I saw the rumors and I saw the Netflix, uh, the, the hashtag cancel Netflix. I saw all, all of that. Um, but I really didn't pay much attention to it. Have you mm -hmm. seen the movie cuties? Yes. Yes. And, 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 and read interviews, read and watched interviews with the producer talking about her intent um, in the film. And, and I think that, you know, for your listeners um, that, you know, maybe live in a cave and are not aware of this, you know, Cuties is this uh, film that's on Netflix um, that is about basically the hypersexualization of, um, uh, of young girls. And the story is about an 11 year old girl um, who wants to be popular. She wants to be part of the cool kids. And she sees that, you know, they dress um, like MTV videos. Although, you know, I know, I, know, I know now it's not really on MTV and I, it's just, I just say MTV because I'm old, but <laughs> that, you know, that, uh, you know, she, she wants to, she, she learns to dress and dance and twerk like, um, you know, like the people in hip hop videos and, and such like that, because that's what these other girls are doing. And that's how she gets to be part of the cool club. And the movie, um, you know, very intentionally is, is intended to make you feel uncomfortable realizing um, how these girls sexualize themselves and then are engaging in, you know, hypersexual kind of provocative sort of behavior and dress um, based on, you know, what is in the, what is in entertainment, what is in social media, et cetera. And, um, I, you know, Netflix um, uh, maybe didn't do a great job in um, advertising this and marketing this film because mm -hmm. they they presented kind of the sexual aspect of of it without some of the social criticism that was that this really embedded. Um, and so people are flipping out over the, over the headline, over the poster of it, over a, you know, a two minute clip of, from the movie without understanding the whole context. And, and I get that. I mean, my, you know, my book, The Myth of Sex Addiction, um, you know, the, the, I get attacked all day long about it by people who just argue with the title yeah. and they've never read the book. They've never listened to my arguments. And they're just arguing that, you know, that, that I shouldn't say it's a myth. Well, let's talk about it. And yeah. so I, I think the, what I'm interested in is, is dialogues and conversations about these issues that go deeper than just our emotional reaction. Um, I, I think our emotional reactions are valid, but we also have to temper them with some, some thinking about, you know, um, uh, facts and context and everything else. And, I, you know, and, and uh, there's this weird panic right now. I, I say weird panic, but it feels like the 1990s with the satanic ritual abuse movement when um, um, we believed that there were all these satanic secret cults sexually abusing and, and killing children um, and hidden throughout the United States. And it feels like that now because now there's all this store, all these panics about, well, there's, there's all these pedophiles everywhere. Yeah. 
and you know, and and everything is about pedophiles in the government, and and this, that, and the other thing is this the QAnon Hollywood is, pedophile rings, and right, yeah. and yep. QAnon, and PizzaGate, and the thing, the thing that I say about these issues that that surprises people is that, you know, sixty percent of sexual abuse against children is committed by non pedophiles. Mm -hmm. That a majority of the children who get sexually abused are abused by people who are not sexually attracted to children, but they are intoxicated, they're high on methamphetamine, they are um, mentally or cognitively disturbed, they are angry. Um, I see, uh, and, and I've treated, you know, I've, I've, I've done this treatment now for, for decades, working with victims and defenders. And, um, you know, and, and I see offenders who sexually abuse a child to get back at some adult say that child's parent mm. and um and so it's it, it's not about sex but it is it, it, it's about both it's a, it's anger and sex and and, it, and it's power and it's control and it's context and it's grief and it's loss and it's everything else so i get angry at these people on twitter who you know say that they are trying to protect kids from sexual abuse by banning netflix yeah. well you know i i'm sorry but fuck you if you really <laughs> care about kids then you need to have a deeper conversation mm -hmm. about what it takes to protect children because it's not just about killing or banning pedophiles that's yeah. not going to fix the situation right we have to have conversations with our kids and we have to educate them better and we have to provide right. them with resources so that they can pursue it on their own as well and live it through their own context and their own exactly. lens yeah, I and hear we, you on that. We've got to reduce the we've got to reduce the shame. I mean, mm. the one thing I go back to often is, um, you know, the Netherlands. The Netherlands starts, um, you know, comprehensive, um, scientifically based, non shame based sex education at age six and seven, and they have lower rates of teen pregnancy. They have lower rates of sexual abuse. Um, they have lower rates of sexual behavior problems um, uh, than the United States. Mm -hmm. Because they're creating an environment where people can talk about sex without fear that they're going to be judged or shamed. And this shame-based, panic-based, reactive-based kind of approach to any kind of sex that we don't like actually makes the shame and the secrecy worse. Yeah. It increases the likelihood that um, you know, a pedophile who needs help and wants to not, not offend against children is not going to ask for help. And a kid who gets sexually abused is not going to ask for help or report it because they're going to be afraid that they're going to be told that it was their fault. Or some kind of moral failing on their end as well. Exactly. Yeah. And, 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 and I just, I, I get frustrated. I get upset with these reactive cancel wars um yeah. because they don't they don't fix anything no we just try and remove the obstacle instead of trying to understand why the obstacle grew in the first place and i agree yeah. with you the shame thing it's and don't you think that like what the Netherlands does with their whole model is like once you start informing a kid about it and i've noticed this with my kids they're like eh okay and then they're not interested because you're not keeping it a secret because don't we That's lust right. after that forbidden fruit and we want to go for that thing that we've been told is something we shouldn't want. Well, now we want it more, but if we understand it and we can see both the function of it and even the beauty in it or even the spirituality behind it, it's not something you're feeling like you're lacking that you have to hurry up and fulfill. And now you're yeah. like, eh, I know what that's all about. Now it's messy, it's sticky, it's sweaty, it's gross. I can wait. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's wild to me. I wrote my first book, Insatiable Wives, you know, published back in 2009, you know, and 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 over the past couple of weeks, right, we've been hearing about the hot wife and the cuckold. Falwell Jr. and the cuckoldry, and, yeah. And I'm like, you know, I mean, part of me is like, hey, look, it's not my fault, right? I didn't create this just because I wrote the book. <laughs> but it is it's extraordinary to me to to see um you know how, how how clearly this stuff plays out i mean the um with these communities these these uh, you know the, these networks 
that, you know, they, they idealize and they reify, you know, traditional kind of um, uh, conservative masculinity views. Um, and, you know, and they, 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 they calcify, uh, you know, these heteronormative, stereotypical um, uh, gender values. And, and then they're surprised when this stuff happens with, with Jerry Falwell Jr., mm -hmm. you know, stepping outside that. And, and it is because of all of the energy they're putting to suppressing and controlling that stuff. I mean, it was wild a couple of years ago. Um, I, I wrote this, maybe it wasn't a couple of years ago, might have been just six months or a year ago. The time has no meaning right now, so who can tell? <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> and I wrote this piece about the politics of cuckolding. And, um, and I was talking about the fact that, um, you know, Paul Manafort, um, uh, Trump's, you know, uh, campaign president mm -hmm. is, is alleged to have been engaging in cuckolding. Roger Stone um, mm -hmm. um, was big into swinging and cuckolding. And, um, and, and I said, you know, I talked about just the stuff I just said about, you know, how the these values really increase the taboo and the taboo increases the excitement, which increases the allure, what you just said, that spiral. And I had this guy reach out to me who he said, you know, look, I'm, he said, I'm literally a Nazi skinhead. Um, I, he said, I, I spent all day in, in these communities um, and, and it's a huge part of my identity. But he said, I can never tell all of these guys in this community that the thing that gets me off the most is thinking about my girlfriend cheating on me with, you know, and, and, uh, uh, an Indian or an African American, because the, wow. um, the, the the taboo of that is just so unbelievably exciting to me. And you know, and and we talked about how, you know, he he spent so much time and energy fighting to be this thing that he was told he had to be, that it became it became not only exciting, but a release to give up that work, right? To, to you mm. know, to, to stop fighting to try to be this superman, this super white man who, of course, your wife would never cheat on you, um, especially with a person of color. Yeah. To give that up. Wow. Was really powerful in a surprising way for him. That sounds like um, surrender to the enemy. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, it's surrender, but it but it's also this interesting thing because it you surrender to this thing that you've been fighting and been mm -hmm. so afraid of, and then you find out that it doesn't kill you. Mm -hmm. You find out that you can survive it. You find out that this thing that you were so afraid of being weak or cheated on, that the world doesn't end and your heart doesn't explode. And then you can pick up and walk out the other end and move on with life. Hmm. I think, you know, as, as I work with people in the BDSM communities, oftentimes, I mean, that's, that's, there's some, there, there's some of that layer in there in terms of submission. And do people also then eroticize their traumas from their past too? And that's the way they work it out. Have you noticed that? Or are you not big on that whole eroticization theory? Um, it is one component, um, the, within the, the, the sex therapy and kind of clinical community, um, around this issue, um, there is definitely some, some validity to this idea that, um, people sometimes use, you know, sexual behavior, BDSM, fantasy, play, etc., as a way to, internalize, integrate, overcome um, uh, sexual trauma kind of history. And um, there's a, a lovely book um, called uh, Sexual Outsiders by uh, Richard Sprout and David Ortman. David Ortman's a New York psychotherapist who's just an incredible um, human being. I mean, he's, he's one of the, literally one of the best therapists I've ever kind of been around. And, um, and that, the book is all about that. It's about BDSM and therapy. Um, on the other hand, the, there is some there is some some reservation because we 
we don't want traumatized people going out there and trying to, you know, create uh, BDSM kind of activities when they don't know how to do that safely. And mm-hmm. you know, it's one of the criticisms I have of the Fifty Shades of Grey kind of phenomenon because it introduced a lot of people to what I call varsity level sex when they're not even ready to play on the JV team. Mm. And these are, you know, th- these are very sophisticated emotional, physical, and sexual kind of interactions that requires a tremendous amount of communication, consent, mm-hmm. self-awareness, negotiation to, to implement safely. And so the, the, the caution that I have is that I don't, and I've seen people with trauma who, you know, think that BDSM can be the solution and they jump in and they're not safe with how they do it and they get traumatized further. Mm, Yeah. Do you also think that a lot of people probably dabble in BDSM thinking it's solely just about sex when it seems to be from what I've read so much more than just sex and sometimes doesn't even include sex? Um, Yes, there, you know, the, uh, I mean, again, we're learning a lot um, uh, about, you know, about, about BDSM and those interests. There are certainly some people, you know, for whom it is an intensely sexual interest and for others, um, uh, sex or orgasm um, is really not even part of, part of the, 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 the experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I believe in a big tent approach in that I, um, I want people to be able to um, have both yeah. and be accepted. Um, sometimes I, it's funny because uh, especially within sexual communities, there's, there's a, still a lot of shaming that goes on. Mm-hmm. Um, even though, you know, most people in sexual sub communities, sex, alternative sexual communities have experienced, you know, shame for their sexuality, they then turn around and shame other people. You know, we're always kicking the person on the ladder that's lower yeah. than us. And so like, like polyamory people shame swingers for just being about casual sex and not being about love. Mm-hmm. Swingers shame uh, couples because um, the wife is having sex and the husband isn't. Mm. Um, uh, People in BDSM oftentimes will shame other people within BDSM for not doing it right. Mm. Um, The right and the wrong way to do it. Yeah. And so again, I, you know, I'm, that, yeah, I, I hate that they called the book Fifty Shades of Grey because it, it really is all about the the gray zone. I li- yeah. as a therapist, I, I don't know if you're like me, but I live in the gray zone. Yeah. Um. You know, with my patients, uh, you know, let's move beyond good and bad. Let's let's move yeah. beyond right and wrong. Let's move beyond black and white, and and let's talk about the values and principles that we want to pursue to be healthy and to take care of ourselves because that's how we navigate all of this very complex gray zone. Right. And then does it feel good too? I mean, that's what I want to know. It, it, right. I'll try it if it feels good. Sure. And if it feels good, I might want to do it again. I think that's the thing we leave behind. We're so caught up in the, the morality of it and what we've been told, mm-hmm. especially when you come from a Christian community, it's like what is and is not acceptable to God, but it's like, well, pleasure is acceptable to God. And so, so long as all people involved are consenting to the pleasure of it, you know, that's supposed to be a part of it. But we, we mistrust pleasure. Yeah. Um, and, 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 it's easy to blame that on, you know, uh, Christian kind of Puritanism, um, and 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 to a degree, I think there is some 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 uh, legitimacy to that, because because a lot of it, especially in Christian community, you can trace back to Augustine, and yep. you know who you know rejected, um, you know, physical pleasures. Um, but the Greeks had been doing um, uh, a lot of that same kind of dialogue as well, that that philosophy, and and there is this. There is just this belief that, you know, for instance, 
a person who never masturbates is more moral and a better person than a person who does. But if you don't uh, masturbate, doesn't that harm your sperm count? It potentially does. It potentially <laughs> lowers your testosterone levels in males. Um, it will cause you to have uh, nocturnal emissions, wet dreams, because um, particularly in reproductive age males, um, we need to have a, an orgasm about once a month to clear out the old sperm. Right. Um, if you don't masturbate or have sex, then your body will have a wet dream to get rid of the sperm. Um, which, you know, it's funny because, uh, you know, in the uh, um, sex addiction uh, community and also in like the, um, the nofap anti-porn community and stuff like that, they, they tell people, men, to take a 90-day abstinence pledge, you know, with mm -hmm. to, to not have sex and not masturbate, not have an orgasm. Um, well, and oh, okay, but it's not going to have any physiological effect other than probably a negative one. And it's going to increase the likelihood of wet dreams, which then people experience and feel like they relapsed or feel like it, mm. um, uh, it is an aspect of their sexuality now that's out of control and that they have to fight even harder to control themselves um, sexually. And they hate themselves and shame themselves. I, I, I treated this one man who, um, uh, you know, he'd been diagnosed as a porn addict. And so he was, you know, in treatment and he was trying not to masturbate, trying not to have sex. And his wife, you know, hated, you know, the, the porn and, and, and viewed him as a sex addict and everything else. So the guy's doing it. He's not having, he's not, he's not masturbating. He and his wife are not having sex, but then he has a wet dream in the night and, and semen gets on her and she feels assaulted. And he feels as though, mm. um, you know, he caused this and that it was yet another sign of, of sexual weakness. And, I was, and, and, and the sex addiction therapist were treating it as though this was, you know, this was a sign of illness. And I'm like, wait, wait a minute. This is how the body works. Yeah. Um, so I, wow. I, 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 I think we need to temper all of this stuff. And I, I think that... Spending time thinking about your sexuality and wanting to consciously integrate and incorporate your sexuality and into your life and identity is a very positive and healthy thing. And so I think that people in the NoFap community, for instance, they may, there may be aspects to what they're doing that is healthy because they're thinking about what kind of life they want and how they want sexuality to be a part of that life. And that is a very uh, powerful, important, valuable um, kind of conversation to have with yourself without the shame, because the, the shame and the shame comes from, again, that this, this view that pleasure and enjoying pleasure somehow makes you weak, somehow makes you vulnerable, makes you able to be manipulated or controlled, um, somehow makes you evil yeah um and and that's the stuff that i like to unpack in therapy with people in terms of trying to understand well what is it about masturbation what is it about this kind of sexual behavior that you really want to engage in that you feel so badly about where's the bad coming from let's unpack that yeah. Um, well, it's the yeah. and, for, and for Christianity, it's the separation of the body and the spirit, and somehow that must mean one is higher, one is lower, one is good, one is bad, and we right. separated ourselves instead of integrating ourselves. And you know, yeah. you brought up something curious too, is that we should be examining our sexuality. And one of the things that kind of struck me within the last, I'd say, two years is I thought no one ever asks us if we want our our accepting of what we are supposed to be attracted to like we never asked those questions growing up and it always frustrated me you know like well you just assume i like boys but what if i did like girls and we don't ever ask that question of ourselves. i mean in my own relationship with my husband we've been going well are we actually telling the truth if we say we're heterosexual how do we know you know have you ever been with a man honey no well, I've never been with a woman, so how do I know? 
I'm heterosexual. How do I not know? You know, you know what I mean? We don't ask these questions and we just go, okay, stamp, I'm straight, go with it. Not going to question it, but we should question our, our sexuality. And we should also recognize that, I don't know, I, I've seen this with even just my own children. I don't want to say it's fluid, but in a way I do want to say it's fluid because I think people change their mind. Like I, one of my friends in high school, she was straight, straight as an arrow, all about the boys, the varsity boys, the athletic boys. She got to college and she was like, and then I changed my mind. And I just thought, okay, I'm accepting of that. Why can't we be accepting of that as well? Like we, maybe we do go through a transformation. Maybe you can live 20 years as a heterosexual in a happy marriage. But then after that, you're like, you know what? I'm going to just try something else because that I think kind of corroborates that whole idea. We aren't actually meant to be in a forever relationship, but because like, we're not wired for that. Are we? I think some people are, um, uh, but I think others are not. Um, I think that, you know, monogamy works, lifetime monogamy works really well for some people. Serial monogamy works really well for some people. And then the the problem comes up, though, that we shame the people that don't fit into that mm. box. Yeah. And we tell them there's something wrong with them. And, and again, I mean, I, you know, um, Chris Ryan, author of um, uh, the book uh, Sex at Dawn, mm -hmm. you know, is a good friend of mine. And, and I agree with a lot of his premises. But I don't think that non-monogamy is right for everybody. Because I think that there are many people who don't have the, the self-awareness self or the negotiation skills or the impulse control to make that work. Um, but on the other hand, um, I think that the people who, you know, are right for non-monogamy um, because they are high in sexual sensation seeking, because they are high in openness to experience, um, uh, because they really enjoy sex and they're good at it. Those kinds of people, if you try to force them to be monogamous, are going to be unhappy. Mm. So... Again, I what I what I argue for is a big tent approach that that doesn't you know say to everybody you must fit into a box and if yeah. you don't fit into the box we're going to beat you about the head and shoulders until you do um, because that ultimately that just hurts everybody and and the thing you know the thing that I've really become passionate about is that my field, you know, psychology and behavioral health has unfortunately been playing into that. Um, you know, you mentioned the, the, the mind body split a moment ago, and there's a, there's a, a good, you know, I, I read a lot. There's a, a, a good book called Descartes error by Robin Dawes. It's a little old written in the nineties, but it, um, it unpacks that issue. And, and it, again, it, it explores this idea that, you know, when psychology and mental health kind of separated the mind from the body, when we said, you know, there's your brain and your brain is doing this and you're experiencing this, we were saying you're two different things. But we're really kind of not. We are a brain that is experiencing these things. Mm -hmm. um, that that mind-body split um, oftentimes kind of makes things worse. So for instance, with, with drug and alcohol, uh, you know, addictions, people are taught to shame themselves and hate themselves for not being able to exert self-control over these desires. You should be stronger than your brain. You know, your brain's addicted to this alcohol. Um, and if you stop drinking, you'll have seizures and die. But if you were a stronger person with stronger willpower, um, you could overcome this. Mm. When the reality is, you know, we are that person in that brain, in those neurochemicals. Um, we, we are that brain. Um, and so we, we sometimes make things harder for ourselves and our patients when we endorse these ideas um, and, and the, you know, and, and unfortunately the sex addiction and the porn addiction kind of field has, um, ha has just really replicated that with, with these ideas that, 
you know, this external thing, sexual experience of some kind can take you over and um, make you do things against your will and that you need to fight it. Well, the very act of fighting it may actually make it worse. You know, the, there's this research by Yaniv Ifradi, an Israeli researcher, who showed that, you know, uh, highly religious people who try not to masturbate and try not to think about masturbation actually end up thinking about masturbation more. You know, don't think of a naked white elephant, and if you do, you're a dirty, rotten pervert. And yeah. right now, you know, all, all of your listeners are dirty, rotten perverts because they're yeah. thinking about naked elephants. <laughs> and the, we, we inadvertently incentivize and energize these things that we try to fight against, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to having, for instance, a more compassionate view of ourselves and our struggles, as opposed to perhaps recognizing, um, yeah, this is hard. It's supposed to be hard because sexuality, um, you know, is a very challenging, powerful, emotionally effective thing that impairs our judgment even. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the stories I tell is, uh, you know, uh, Sam Brownback was was governor of Kansas, and he was a, he was also a senator for, for for Kansas, and he he led some of the last hearings in in D.C. in Congress about pornography. And every yeah, every generation or so, there there's Congress will will decide we're going to take on pornography, and it's always you know religious heterosexual people that mm -hmm. are taking on pornography because they're worried that it's changing sexual values. But Brownback told a story about men that he knew that when they checked into a hotel, they had to have the television removed from the hotel so that um, hotel room so that the guys wouldn't be tempted to watch pornography on that, ho on that hotel television. Brownback tells that story as a way of saying, look how dangerous pornography is, that these men had to do something so ridiculous as to have the, have the TV removed in order to have self-control. I tell that same story to my patients and I say, look how fucking smart these guys are. Mm -hmm. That they know that there's a chance in the middle of the night tonight, I could be lonely and tired and horny and I'm away from my, my family. And I might be tempted to engage in a behavior that I would regret in the morning. And so instead of hating themselves and shaming themselves for feeling that vulnerability and that temptation, they make a decision earlier in the day when they're not horny, they're not tired. They make a decision to make it easier to engage in values consistent behavior later at night when they're vulnerable. That's brilliant. It but is. you can only do that if you accept that in yourself. And, and so it goes back to what, what you said a moment ago, Danielle, about have we sat and done some accounting with ourselves about our sexuality, about our sexual desires? How do we feel about our sexual fantasies? Most people never tell anybody Mm -mm. Not their partner, not their therapist about their sexual fantasies because they're afraid they're going to be judged for them. A lot of them tell me. <laughs> More of them are telling Which me. Which I appreciate them. actually. But yeah. yes, um, uh, plenty of people tell me, but I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> and, and I think, and that reflects some changing attitudes and values towards sex in our society. I mean, between 2010 and 2015, our country experienced the greatest social shift in sexual values in recorded human history. Um, in 2010, a majority of our country believed gay marriage was wrong. In 2015, a majority of our country believed gay marriage was right. What changed? During that period, a lot of people came out. Yeah. Um, we had television characters, you know, Will and Grace and such that were, that were publicly gay or not straight. And all of a sudden it forced people to start realizing the only reason we think these things are bad is because people keep them secret. Yeah. 
So I think the, the fact that more people are now starting to share sexual fantasies and desires um, is because we're, we're becoming more tolerant of the diversity of human sexuality. Yeah. What I notice is interesting is when people share that information with me, I, I stop for a minute and I go, are they trying to see how much I can handle or mm-hmm. are they just trying to intentionally push buttons? Because there are those people out there that just love the shock and awe. They tell you what they want to tell you. But I think in, in most, most of these instances, it's people actually going, oh, you can, you can handle that freak part of me. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, I get it. Okay, well, now I want to tell you more because you didn't shame me. Well, I had to learn from that with my husband because when I was going through my whole evangelical phase, I decided everything was wrong. We, uh, we're not doing any of that. God is watching us, judging us, blah, blah, blah. And there was a point where he felt like he could break that friction by being vulnerable and revealing a fantasy to me. And I just recoiled and shamed him and thought, okay, Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how you would ever see a good Christian woman doing that for you. But I had to, I mean, I think I told somebody about that and someone instantly was like, you made him feel that bad. He was that vulnerable with you. And so I really had to grow from that and go, wow, this is a person I promised to spend forever with for better or worse. If we can't be that vulnerable with our partner and tell them our fantasies, what's the point? Then really, what is the point of getting married to someone and making those promises? And that is what I see happening with a lot of men in marriages and sexless marriages right now. They recoil and then they're like, okay, sex is totally off the table. But I go, or maybe she's just bored with the same old sex. Have you tried sharing your fantasy with her? And in a lot of regards, that helps people bring them closer together. Like, why didn't I think of that? Because we're told that if you have these fantasies, something's wrong with you. And so I appreciate yeah. you point that out in, in your books um, that there's really not a big difference in separation of the people who have the freaks and the kinks and the fetishes. There's nothing mentally disturbed about them any less than the rest of society, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I equate it to you know, liking salty or sweet foods. Some people like salty foods, some people like sweet foods. But we don't like judge or shame somebody for liking foods other than the ones we like, right? If my, you know, my wife likes sweet foods and, and I like saltier foods, and at a, at a restaurant, I might look at the menu or she might look at the menu and say, oh, this looks like something you would like, right? What if we had the same approach to sex? Mm. You like this and I like that. There's nothing wrong with you for liking that and me liking this. And we looked at a sexual menu and said, oh, I bet this is something you'd enjoy. Mm. Yeah. Right? Um, the, the, the thing that I'm fascinated by is that we still really don't know how or why people end up with the sexual interests, dispositions, or fantasies that they have. Um, we, we, we make up stories, we make up narratives. You know, people, people will say, well, I'm into spanking because I remember, you know, when I was a kid, I got spanked and, and I remember getting an erection or I remember getting wet and getting turned on during that. And so ever since, spanking has been my thing. Well, Okay, but what about all the people who got spanked and didn't get an erection or didn't get aroused? Why? What was it about you that led to you having that reaction to that experience, right? And we think it's kind of like a roll of the dice. You know, it's a roll of the dice of your genetics and your brain and your social context. Um, you know, Justin Laymiller um, has a lovely book called, you know, Tell Me What You Want, that's about sexual fantasies and sexual fantasy research. And Justin argues, kind of what we've been talking about, that much sexual arousal and fantasy comes out of taboo, that, you know, Republican conservatives more often fantasize about cuckolding and swinging, Democrats and progressives more often fantasize about female domination or about BDSM. And it, it, it's, a, it's about the, the taboos that then, erotic, that then become eroticized. And I think it's a good theory, but I don't think it explains everything. 
Yeah. I, I think it's a start. Um, uh, there's a, a colleague of mine, Jim Faust, who's a, a neurobiologist, researcher, and, and, and psychologist, and, and he suggests that we, we have a, something in our brain that just kind of helps us overcome the orgasmic threshold. In other words, there is something that happens, whether it is external or internal. It is out in the world, whether it's a, you know, a, a, a woman in a, in a tall boot, um, or it's a fantasy in our head about being submissive or being tied up or being dominant that makes it easier for us to orgasm. Hmm. And when we find that thing, and we're like, whoa, that really was hot. That really turned me on. That really made my orgasm better. We go back to it and we keep going back to it because it makes our orgasms better and easier. And, and a fantasy or a fetish or a sexual preference almost kind of grows from that. So it's a mix of hmm. what we are disposed with, what we start with, and what we do with it. Uh, and I had this, I had this patient once who, who shared that he said, I never knew that I had an angel or a demon fetish until I was watching porn. And I happened on this porn where the actors were dressed up as an angel and a demon. And, and he said, I, I had the best nut of my life. And he said, ever since, that when he is having trouble getting turned on or having trouble achieving orgasm, that's what he fantasizes about. That's interesting. So it could be we haven't even discovered what our fet fetishes and fantasies are yet. I mean, we, we might need to just yeah. wait until we happen upon something and we're like, yeah. oh, oh, that's and, kind of and, interesting. And, yeah, yeah, there's this funny meme online and, and, and it's a you know, little cartoon of somebody looking at porn on the computer and, and his thought bubble says, oh my God, that's gross. There are people that are into that and then they shows him watching it and then he goes, oh my God, I'm into it. <laughs> but, then, but then it raises the question, you know, are there things that we might be into that don't exist yet. Mm. Um, and, yeah. and that would suck. You know, what if you were made to have a fetish for a certain kind of alien, but we haven't encountered those aliens. <laughs> and you never get to have that, you know, that really powerful suck. experience, right? Um, <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, so th that's where my brain goes sometimes in terms of just trying to, just trying to unpack and, and conceptualize and integrate all of this really remarkable complexity of human sexuality and humanity and, and what we do with it. Mm. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I want to be respectful of your time. So just to kind of end here, what's next for you? You got a new book coming out? You... No, not, well, not right now. Um, I, you know, I mean, I've, I wrote three books. I always wanted Didn't to Didn't I do book. enough for you people? No. <laughs> no, right. Yeah. I, I, um, and I, uh, uh, writing books is interesting. I mean, it's a, it's an amazing experience. Um, um, you learn so much about yourself and you learn so much about a subject to be able to write yeah. a book about. It. Um, and it, and it helps you help. It's helped me professionally. It, it is, um, you know, given me a lot of credibility and a lot of ability to impact kind of larger conversations. Um, but, uh, but I don't know. Um, I, I don't know if I'll write another book. Um, I, you know, I, sometimes it's like an addiction, right? You, you, you feel the need to, and you have to write the book to get it out. Yeah. But, um, I'm doing, a, interestingly, I'm doing a lot of forensic work right now. Um, really? And it's not something I'm super public about, but um, because, you know, their publicity and media doesn't necessarily help you, right? Um, yeah. But I've been doing a whole lot of forensic consulting um, around sexuality issues. And so testifying as an expert witness in cases related to sexual crimes, um, uh, issues of BDSM, um, 
uh, interestingly, there have been um, a number of cases of celebrities filing insurance claims um, uh, claiming sex addiction as a, as a disease or an illness that, you know, resulted in these financial losses. Um, and then the insurance companies are hiring me to come in and evaluate the situation and say whether this was kind of a legitimate, you know, loss a medical loss or not. Um, can so somebody really claim that I was so aroused? I wasn't, now that I'm asking the question, yeah, they probably could because that's when my husband gets me to try new stuff. I'm already aroused. And I think I've read in a book that it's actually plausible, right? So if you're aroused, you can be a little convinced or persuaded to do something you wouldn't normally do. Yeah, so um, uh, Dan Ariely uh, is a, a neuroeconomist um, at Stanford and did this really remarkable research where he sent uh, laptops wrapped up in plastic, plastic's important, um, home with college students. And he had college students um, uh, watch pornography on the computer. Um, but before they watched the, the pornography, they would answer questions. Would you do this? Would you do this? Of sex, somebody you don't know, sex with somebody you don't like, without a condom, would you spank somebody or be spanked? Then has them watch pornography on the computer and masturbate, hence the plastic. While they're watching the porn and jerking off, um, the computer will freeze and one of those questions pops up and you have to answer it to make the porn come back. Mm. And what they found was that, yeah, when we are turned on, we're more likely to say we would have sex with somebody we don't know or sex with somebody we don't like or sex without a condom. That's how sex works. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is normal um, for sexuality to affect our judgment. But it doesn't take away our self-control because mm -hmm. you know, self-identified sex addicts, when they have um, actually done testing on them, they're not more impulsive they're not, they don't have any greater or worse um, difficulties uh, exerting self-control over sexuality or any other aspect of their life. Hmm. So sex addicts actually don't have more sex than anybody else. They feel worse about the sex they have. Hmm. And the and reason that they're identifying as a sex addict is because of that feeling worse. And that's about the values conflict. Hmm. But can, can people claim that, um, you know, sexuality, sex addiction um, led to them uh, making really bad choices? Yeah, they do. And in fact, um, there are cases, um, and I've written about this, I have an, an academic article about it. There are cases of people, you know, claiming sex addiction was why they raped somebody. Um, that, you know, is in fact very, very common for people to claim that porn addiction is why they got caught watching child pornography. But watching child pornography is, is a hallmark indicator of pedophilia, not sex addiction. And there's, there, there is that idea, there's this embedded idea that pornography or sexuality in general is a slippery slope coded in KY where you start looking at, you know, playboy at the top or you start with normal sexuality and then you slide down this slippery slope and you're engaging in taboo criminal, you know, um, sexually assaultive kind of behaviors. Yeah. Reality is that's not the case. No. Most people's sexuality is very, very boring most people fantasize and think about the same kind of thing over and over and over again. They may watch the same kind of porn with different people over and over and over again. They find what works for them and that's what they gravitate towards. Um, and so unfortunately though, because the legal system and because our society has kind of adopted this idea that you know, sex is bad, too much sex is bad for you, that being tur too turned on, you can't control yourself. Um, uh, that, yeah, I mean, like, like you know, you've talked about, you know, um, Christian kind of values and, you know, you're wearing a spaghetti strap top, right? Mm -hmm. Which Christian women tell me, you know, Naked shoulders. Strap. Yes, oh my God, I can see your naked shoulders. <sighs> You know, and there's this idea that women have to hide your fucking shoulders so that boys in, in, in your classroom don't lose control. Fuck that. Yeah. I'm a guy. I have so, and I apologize for cussing. I cuss, but. That's but, fine. That's what I do on this show. <laughs> it, it, you know, 
I reject this idea that um, that sexual self control is impossible for some. Mm. Yeah. Um, I I don't think that's I don't think that's healthy. I don't think it's productive, and it's certainly not scientifically accurate. Mm -mm. Mm. This has been such an incredible honor. I just want to thank you again for joining me on this episode and for sharing all of your wisdom with us. And I'm just going to keep following and retweeting you because you're entertaining for me on Twitter. So thank you. Well, thank you, Danielle. It's lovely to meet you. Thanks for reading my stuff and, and sharing my ideas. I look forward to talking with you again in the future. All right. Take care, David. Thank you. Bye-bye.